Hunter. Hi. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this report launch, Defending Freedom of Expression, Fake News Laws in East and Southeast Asia. Uh, we welcome all speakers, all reactors, and all participants who have uh, kindly joined us for this uh, report launch. This report is produced jointly between the Asia Center and the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats with the kind support of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation East and Southeast Asia Regional Office. Um, so we welcome you all. And without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Representative Francis uh, Gerald uh, Blue Abaya to make some welcome remarks. Let me just briefly introduce uh, Francis. Francis is Secretary General of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats. He is a member of the Philippine House of Representatives. He is vice chairperson of various committees, including climate change, information and communications technology. And I take note that Francis is, uh, was an architect. And so it's quite fitting that we start with Francis to lay the foundations of this discussion today. Francis, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, good afternoon to everyone. It is my uh, honor to welcome everyone to this report launch as we examine the existing legal frameworks and policies governing disinformation in East and Southeast Asia. True to CAL's values, today's webinar is aimed at equipping and providing policy tools to our legislators, political party leaders, academics, civil society acti activists, and journalists to protect freedom of expression. Hopefully, by the end of this session, everyone can appreciate the recommendations of our panelists to address human rights and democratic gaps in countries where disinformation and the proliferation of fake news are strong and prevalent. Our reactors are experts and noteworthy persons in their own fields. I especially look forward to my favorite columnist, John Neri from the Philippine Daily Inquirer, when he expounds his views on the disinformation terrain in the Philippines. I encourage everyone, especially the audience and the viewers of this telecast, to engage by sending in your questions or views about the topics and issues discussed this afternoon. Finally, I thank the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats for being the vanguard of liberalism and democratic ideals in our region. Today's event supports that vision. So let me officially welcome everybody May we all have a productive afternoon ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francis, for your kind re uh, welcome remarks. And without further ado, uh, let me turn the floor over to Dr. James Gomez, who is the Regional Director of Asia Center, who will present the key findings uh, of the uh, joint report. Uh, James. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as, as the team, uh, you know, sets up the presentation for me to uh, show you, uh, let me then uh, begin by uh, uh, placing today's report launch in, in, in context. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, stuff happening in Myanmar. And one of the important features I think we need to look forward to in terms of uh, what's happening in, in the region is how the internet is being treated. I think moving forward, what we will see is states will try to shut down, throttle access to internet as an additional tool in together with loss. So, so I think what this report uh, you know, pre uh, gives us today is the loss, and then taking on board these laws, I think we also need to look at the, the control of the technology. 
So uh, I'll begin by just uh, showing you the outline of my presentation. Next, please. Uh, I'll take you to the background of the report, uh, the methodology, the types of disinformation, legal, non-legal me measures, who the fake news criminals are, and, and finally, what's the impact on freedom of recommend, uh, expression and the types of recommendation we need to consider. Next. Essentially, you know, when we talk about disinformation, we need to think about misinformation. Misinformation is false information uh, that's, you know, not intended to create harm. Uh, you have malinformation uh, where uh, information is based on a skewed re re reality uh, used to, you know, inflict harm. Uh, more popularly, uh, you know, uh, this is used in politics in negative campaigning. And the current phenomenon we are looking at is the purposeful distortion of information to deliberately cause harm or, uh, you know, uh, cause a political uh, uh, outcome. Now, uh, in this report, uh, we've seen uh, the fake news laws uh, undertake two types of behavior. I think uh, the type of government determines the type of laws that come into place as well. Uh, um, and this is, I think, the fundamental distinction between East, East Asia and Southeast Asia. You find, you know, Sun's China, uh, in East Asia, you have, you know, broadly some element of multi-party democracy, and also you have independent institutions. Whereas the flip is true for Southeast Asia, where you tend to have dominant political parties or political forces, and many of the uh, uh, institutions are centrally controlled. Uh, there are four types of disinformation uh, that this report identifies. Uh, the more popular one is what we call the clickbait disinformation, the kinds of uh, emails and messages that you get, you know, uh, asking you to share your personal information so someone could transfer uh, money or some sensational false information that, you know, uh, causes you to click on a particular news site. Uh, secondly, you have hate speech disinformation. Uh, this is based on trying to create conflict and divisions account, uh, along race and religion, around gender identity. Uh, it also under COVID taken a very anti-foreigner feeling uh, among refugees, uh, migrant workers, undocumented migrant workers. Uh, you have also uh, political disinformation. Now, this is a new phenomenon. We see that very much played out uh, in several countries in Southeast Asia where competing groups you know, call each other names uh, in order to rally their forces behind them. And finally, uh, we have government uh, disinformation. Now, this is also interesting. I think several governments have begun to announce that they are looking into new legislation so they can deal with, you know, um, uh, manipulative messages from foreign government. And, and, and you know, Taiwan is one of the first ones uh, in, in, in the larger region uh, to have some uh, legislation and Singapore has also announced that it's going to look at legislation on this front. Now there's a suite of legal measures and you know uh, there are three, three tranches of uh, legal measures. The first one is existing laws. You will find that, uh, 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 yeah, we next slide please, existing laws. Yeah, uh, sedition acts, public order acts, Penal codes, computer misuse acts, and telecommunication laws. Now, some countries have not updated their laws. So they use these existing laws to deal with what they frame as misinformation or disinformation online. Some countries have amended these laws. The next set of laws are what we call uh, anti fake news laws. Uh, uh, Singapore has introduced this. Uh, Malaysia introduced this, reversed it, and still thinking about reintroducing it. Now, several other countries, and we saw, uh, you know, um, evidence of this recently uh, uh, in Myanmar, the introduction of uh, cybercrime or cyber security laws. If you go deep into these laws, uh, you will see there's an extensive elaboration of how the state wants to deal with this uh, uh, issue of fake news. Uh, there are two problems here. The first problems are the laws are vaguely worded. And so it becomes a catch-all and the state can sort of put anything 
under the belt as fake news. Secondly, uh, apart from uh, vaguely worded laws, there's no checks and balances. Now, this situation has increased under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, period that we are experiencing. That Again, there are two types of laws. There are specially enacted laws called COVID-19 temporary laws. In some countries, uh, national committees are formed that have special powers in terms of dealing with disinformation. Uh, in particular, disinformation related to COVID-19, uh, uh, remedies, vaccines, you know, movement control orders and such. Or you have the uh, enactment of emergency laws uh, 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 that are also used uh, to, to bring in. Now, what is interesting during this part, and, and, and the report discusses it uh, quite extensively, is really the criticism against government. So governments are very, very prickly in terms of criticism of how they are dealing with uh, the management of the pandemic. Now, laws are not the only measures. You have uh, non-legal measures as well. Now, this has been in the play for the last couple of years. Um, um, uh, fact checking is, is uh, uh, promoted. Uh, media literacy is promoted. Quality journalism is promoted, uh, and tech companies increasingly are demonstrating that they are also uh, taking measures to shut down and close accounts that cause uh, disinformation. But again, uh, there is a problem here. The question is who's paying for fact checking and fact checking for whom? Media literacy program, who's funding media literacy program, and what kind of truths are we uh, um, asked, asked to read? And in terms of quality journalism, and this is, you know, highly desirable, but difficult to deliver. In fact, you know, because of so much challenges, uh, much of the journalism has, uh, you know, dropped in quality and have become um, uh, infotainment. Next. So as a result of these laws, um, we have a new range of criminals, uh, according to the state. And, you know, uh, we dub them as the fake news criminals. And who are these? Uh, you see uh, a lot of young people uh, being, uh, you know, victim of such laws, uh, especially in places like uh, Thailand, Hong Kong, uh, uh, Malaysia, uh, sorry, and uh, Myanmar recently. Uh, you have civil society activists also uh, uh, being brought uh, under charge in these laws, uh, journalists, artists when they critically you know uh, juxtapose some situation in society uh, opposition leaders also you know tend to fall victims of this and tech companies are increasingly also threatened uh, under these laws uh, because if the tech companies don't uh, comply uh, they are subjected to be closed down and pay very very heavy fines so uh, what's the impact the impact is it creates fear uh, it creates a chilling effect. Um, Cambodia uh, is one country where uh, the effect is really cold, uh, so much so that civil society are just waiting for the environment to change before they can even actively consider uh, to participate. Uh, there's a risk of overcriminalization, um, and there is a shrinking of civic space because the digital space is shrunk indirectly because a lot of the action takes place online, uh, indirectly digital civic space is also shrunk. Altogether, this creates a climate of self-censorship. So next, uh, I'll come into the key recommendations that you know uh, parliamentarians, political parties, and other stakeholders can uh, consider. Uh, first, uh, as uh, uh, members of parliament, uh, uh, partners in government, uh, they can um, ensure that they ask their countries uh, to commit to international obligations to have full freedom of expression here. And particularly, we are looking at, uh, uh, you know, doing uh, timely reports to the UPR, making sure that they, you know, follow up with recommendations, uh, inviting special procedures uh, to visit the country, and also looking at SDG 16.10, which deals with access to information and fundamental freedoms. 
Uh, we also ask uh, that national uh, legislations be reviewed to amend existingly uh, vaguely worded laws and to ensure there's a high threshold when restrictions, if at all, uh, need to be imposed and, and if they are, that they uh, follow international standards. Uh, for countries that don't have independent institutions, uh, to ensure that these are set up, national human rights institutions, independent media councils, press councils are very, very important institutions uh, to be part of. And finally, the tech companies pay attention to the kind of political advertisements or dubious accounts you know, and to ensure fact checking across platforms. So this is the broad you know, uh, signposting of the report. I will stop the report here uh, and, uh, uh, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, James, uh, for that uh, comprehensive um, overview of the report and its recommendations. And thank you for uh, keeping to the time. <laughs> much appreciated, allocated. So um, we will now turn to our reactors, uh, our guests who will react to the report, maybe add their own thoughts and, and findings. And so each reactor will have uh, about nine to 10 minutes uh, to react. I kindly ask you to, to you know, uh, keep to the allocated time. Uh, let me, uh, by the way, there was a poll that was just um, um, circulated. I encourage you to please uh, participate in that poll and, and we will give you uh, the results very shortly. Yeah. So let me now turn to uh, Pei Fen Xia, who will react, be our first uh, reactor. Pei Fenxia is a spokesperson and deputy director of the Department of International Affairs of the Democratic Progressive Party of Taiwan. Um, she served as a United Nations diplomat. She was part of the permanent mission of Tuvalu to the UN, and she has worked as an assistant in the national, Taiwan National Security Council. Um, Pei Fen, uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Maybe your, your, please turn on your microphone. Yes. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks, Cal and Asia Center for launching this very important report and all the hard work behind it. This report is indeed very timely. So I recalled the theme of our last year's Cal General Assembly was how we do how do we deal with the challenges of democracy, which have been made more daunting by the pandemic? And one of the challenges is indeed disinformation. As you may remember, our president, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen, delivered the keynote speech on this topic in the opening session of the General Assembly, because Taiwan stands at the forefront of the assault of disinformation. But Taiwan is no exception. Under the COVID-19 pandemic around the world, we observed an increase of disinformation in an all-encompassing attempt to create doubts in our citizens' minds and discredit our government's effort to combat the coronavirus. To this end, I found this report before us to be very informative. By listing and comparing the situations of different countries, this report allows us to get an overall view of different approaches in different countries. For example, on page 26, it says that East Asian governments, aside from Taiwan, rarely have legislation in place, which specifically addresses penalties for disseminating fake news. On page 44, it says Taiwan, contrary to the actions taken by its neighbors in East Asia, has continued its stigmatic response to troubles by implementing additional legislation. This is new information for me, so I found this very interesting and also surprising. And probably uh, also a surprise for many of you as well, because um, therefore I wish to offer some contexts under which Taiwan chooses to use legislation as one of the many approaches to combat this information. And probably clarify that's why this is not so called, in my view, stigmatic response under our country's circumstances. So as, you, as we all know, information manipulation has always been a tool of authoritarian regimes to tarnish democracies 
Over the past few years, this disturbing trend has become a very persistent threat for Taiwan as for many countries, affecting our politics, the polarizing society, creating wages in interpersonal and family relations. And I would say so because according to a research by the variety, Varieties of Democracy, V. Dan, at the University of Gothenburg in, uh, two years ago in 2019, Taiwan was exposed to misleading viewpoints of false information disseminated by foreign governments and their agents, which is mostly, as we all know, from China. And Taiwan is um, being affected more frequent, frequently than any of the 179 countries the project surveyed. And this is why Taiwan has chose one has been one of the first countries to actually to notice, to recognize, and to respond to the spread of disinformation in democracies, including introducing new legislation. But this does not mean that we do not resort to non-legal legislation, uh, non-legal measures, of course. As on pages 35 of, the, of this report, East Asian governments more often rely on non-legal measures to deter the spread of disinformation. And that includes promoting fact-checking initiatives, encouraging media literacy campaigns, collaborating with social media companies and relying on citizens' shared social cultural values. Taiwan also has done all of this above and beyond. If I may share some examples. So under our the leadership of our minister, uh, digital minister, Audrey Tang, who many of you have already known very well, our government agencies formulate official responses under the principles of the three apps, fast, fair, and fun. So pictures with simple messages were published by the government uh, to first capture the attention of citizens and then introduce facts to them. And more importantly, in my view, Taiwan's vibrant civil society and our civic tech community work together to contribute tremendously in the effort to combat disinformation. And at the same time, we also safeguard our democratic values of freedom of speech and expression. So we do not sacrifice the democratic values uh, in front of uh, combating disinformation. So we have organizations such as Taiwan Fact Check Center, COFAX, Gov Zero, Michael Penn, Double Think Lab, and Information Operation Research Group, just to name a few examples. They publish thoroughly researched and detailed reports on check facts and playbooks on authoritarian information manipulation. And we also have organizations such as Fake News Cleaner and the Open Culture Foundation who have also developed media literacy lessons plans. And then they go to travel around the country, to countryside, to places like senior centers and schools to educate our citizens on the negative effects of the disinformation. And we also have a civic tech organizations that develop chatbots for popular chat applications in Taiwan. So our users, Taiwanese users can fact check as they receive links from their friends on social media. So as our president Tsai said last year in the opening session of the General Assembly, Taiwan is an example that a country can develop strategies and ways to, to combat this information without damaging its democratic value and procedural and systems. And also, as this report found, I found it very, very interesting. Democracies deal with disinformation through ways that safeguard human rights and democratic practices, whereas in authoritarian regimes, it is the authority of the state to decide what is fake news and to punish accordingly. So I think the context is very, very important. And the same legislation and measures may have totally different meanings and impacts under different regimes. So to this end, I sincerely hope, I, I believe Taiwan still has a lot to learn and also to learn from the lessons listed in this very important report. But at the same time, I also sincerely hope this Taiwan model can and does hold over some help to our brothers and sisters in the region. So this is my reaction. Thank you very much, Pei Fen, for those uh, interesting remarks. And I'm sure we will come back to them and uh, uh, subsequently. Um, let me now turn to uh, John Neri, 
John Neri, uh, who is a journalist from the Philippines, he's an opinion column, columnist at the Philippine Daily Inquirer, the country's largest newspaper. He is on the Inquirer's editorial council and represents the newspaper on the executive board of the Asian News Network. He serves as convener for the Consortium of Democracy and Disinformation. He was visiting research fellow at ICES in Singapore and Neiman Fellow in Journalism uh, at Harvard University. So, John, uh, please, the, nice to see you again, and, and the floor is yours. Good to see you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to Carl and the Asia Center for this uh, necessary report. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, especially for us in the Philippines, to develop a comparative mindset. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is a, a very necessary next step for us to take to consider uh, how other countries are doing uh, as far as this information and as far as uh, the pandemic uh, is concerned. If you will allow me, I will share uh, just a couple of slides. Um, I hope you can see that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I, I really just want to give a, a quick situation around the Philippines based on the uh, parameters uh, defined by the report. I want to say first that it's important to develop a comparative mindset and also uh, that uh, it's important if we all learn to speak the same language when we're describing the same phenomena. Uh, I take note that James used the now widely shared uh, definition of terms, uh, first uh, formulated by Claire Wardle and Hossein Derrickson. So these are the three uh, key definitions of misinformation, malinformation, and disinformation. I'm hoping that the four types of uh, disinformation that uh, the Asia Center has identified in its uh, continuing research can also gain some traction. I have to point out certain concerns. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, it's unusual that hate speech, which is a problem in itself, uh, uh, is uh, conflated with uh, disinformation, uh, but it might be a, a good way to approach these uh, twin problems. Um, uh, also, the while it's important to pinpoint that some disinformation is by foreign governments, uh, in the Philippines, for instance, uh, some of the political disinformation is very clearly uh, from outside the country. Uh, they don't know how to speak in Filipino, in the local languages, their English is uh, uh, very elementary. Uh, just you know, doing a content analysis Make, would make you think that uh, foreign government governments are also pushing political disinformation uh, in the Philippines. But having expressed those concerns, I really hope that these four types of uh, disinformation uh, it would be a framework that uh, would increasingly be shared by many of us uh, across the region. Um, so, a situation from the Philippines. As far as new legislation is concerned, there I cannot see any traction for any of the uh, proposed bills. Uh, Senate Bill 1492 was uh, uh, filed in 2017. Senate Bill 9, which is the Anti-False Content uh, Act, uh, which was filed by the Senate President, the third highest ranking public official in the Philippines, uh, was filed in 2019. Um, I think a couple of hearings have been conducted, but I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think they're going anywhere, uh, especially because we don't know what we're doing as far as the pandemic is concerned. So that's that. But old or other laws have been repurposed or realigned to crack down on freedom of expression. So 10175, Republic Act 10175, is the Cybercrime uh, Prevention Act. And that's, that's the law that convicted Maria Ressa the, this law redefined libel uh, 
extended the prescription period or gave the judge an opportunity to extend, in my view, unconstitutionally, the uh, prescription period. And that's the reason why Maria Ressa uh, and her former researcher, who no longer works for Rappler, uh, were convicted of cyber libel. Probably Act uh, 11469 is the uh, first emergency law passed uh, in the pandemic. That's the Bayanihan to Heal as One. And uh, the report was uh, uh, good to point out that there is one provision there that can be misused to crack down on freedom of expression. This, this is the provision about uh, spreading false information. Um, but even without this Republic Act 11469, uh, there are many other uh, laws in place, and there have been many instances of uh, official uh, misconduct to put the fear of God in many Filipinos as far as uh, uh, the exercise of their freedom of expression is concerned. Um, really, I know we've, we've used this, it's become a cliche, but in the Philippines, under Duterte, the rule of law has been weaponized. Uh, uh, that allows the former chief of the Philippine National Police to decline to arrest Imelda Marcos uh, after a, an adverse ruling in the anti-graft court because, in the words of that uh, former police chief, she was too old. Uh, on the other hand, they are very quick to arrest uh, poor Filipinos for the smallest uh, perceived infractions of the existing laws. But the real concern for me uh, as a political observer um, is how do we address the situation when the government is the primary source and the essential enabler of fake news and other forms of disinformation? In 2018, our Consortium on Democracy and Disinformation uh, conducted its first uh, national conference. And in that conference, we presented a video uh, ex, uh, compilation of exhibits, you might say, exhibits one to, um, I don't know, 25, all examples of President Duterte himself uh, sharing fake news and other forms of disinformation. So what do we do? I, th that, that's the real problem. Uh, let me just end uh, this uh, brief reaction uh, by just very, very quickly going through another important uh, parameter that James and Asia Center pointed out uh, to us, which is the use of non-legal measures. Fact-checking is an ongoing uh, uh, effort in the Philippines, but th th we have mixed results. So check.ph was the first time that uh, competing media organizations uh, worked together uh, on a collaborative fact-checking uh, campaign. This was to cover the 2019 uh, midterm elections. Um, it has had some successes, but uh, I think it also has, has some real uh, operational problems. Uh, I don't know if it will be around for the 2022 presidential elections. There are ongoing institutional efforts, uh, but uh, very little of the kind of uh, collaboration that uh, Czech Facta, for instance, in um, Indonesia uh, is a good example of. As far as quality journalism is concerned, um, yes, th there is an increasing emphasis on this. Uh, if there's anything you need to know about what's happening in Mindanao, the go-to source is Minden News. But their financial base is not stable. Uh, it would be good if they could have some uh, kind of uh, uh, long-term support. Rappler is doing very well uh, in spite of the fact that the, uh, they, they, they have been uh, one of the primary victims of the weaponization of the rule of law. Uh, that's an excellent example of a, an online uh, news operation that knows how to contextualize social media posts. Uh, that would be philstar.com. There are continuing efforts in media literacy. That's what our consortium uh, Democracy and Disinformation uh, is involved in, but again, uh, there are many of these going on, but there's no one overall, uh, you know, clearing house or, or hub. 
Uh, as far as tech companies are concerned, uh, it's a mix. Uh, in the last two and a half years or so, maybe the last three years, uh, we have improved, we meaning media organizations, have improved our, our relationship with Facebook. Uh, they are much more uh, attuned to our concerns. Uh, Twitter has been, uh, on a global scale, uh, much more uh, uh, proactive. But the big problem, not only in the Philippines, but globally, is YouTube. Uh, that's 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 the biggest hole. Uh, there's a, a real race going on right now. What is the main platform where this information is spread in the Philippines? Is it Facebook or is it YouTube? Uh, if you're talking about Marcos-related disinformation, YouTube is the preferred channel. That uh, they've seeded that for the last several years, and it just uh, and YouTube's uh, institutional response is well, it's opinion. Uh, so it's 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 quite difficult uh, to monitor and uh, uh, control uh, the kind of uh, disinformation that is prevalent in YouTube. Maybe I'll end there. I think I've uh, 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 run my. I think that's my time. Uh, Again, thank you to Calden Asia Center for a, a necessary uh, report. Thank you, John, thank you. Uh, um, for those uh, fine comments and uh, lots to think about there. And we will certainly come back to some of your points. Before we continue to the next uh, reactor speaker, uh, let me just tell you the results of the first poll. Um, 19 out of you of the 36 people responded yes. Uh, freedom of speech expression has been negatively impacted. One person said no, and a few of you uh, did not uh, react yet. So there is a, a second poll coming soon. Uh, we would appreciate if you, you know, give your thoughts, uh, share your thoughts on that second poll that will come in a few minutes. So let me now turn to our last but not least uh, reactor. Let me turn. Let let me turn to uh, Kun Siripa Nan. Intravichen, I hope I have your name right. <laughs> it's nice to see you again. Um, Siripa currently serves as assistant of former Thai Prime Minister um, Chuan Lik Pai. She is also the deputy spokesperson of the Democrat Party. She was also a member of Global Shapers Community Bangkok Hub. So um, please, the floor is yours, Siripa. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. I'm glad to meet all of you here. Yeah. And firstly, I'd like to congratulate today Asia Centers and Cal for successfully releasing this report. And I'm thrilled to see the Cal and Asia Center report on fake news legislation in East and Southeast Asia. I believe that fake news is a critical issue the whole world is facing, especially within politics. The problem is only getting worse and must be dealt with urgently. And I'm also thrilled to be invited as a reviewer of this report as it pertains to Thailand. And as mentioned within the discovery that 926 Twitter account is related to the Rojo Thai Army is significant. The fact that fake news is perpetrated by both the pro and anti government factions is undeniable. And as a quick consumer of the news, I found it especially distressing that member of the parliament would participate in spreading the fake news, knowing full well what they are doing. And this hypocrisy is the root of evil. Although the people can exercise some discretions, but the algorithm leaves them in an echo chamber that makes it harder to reach the factual truth. And to give you some update on the legislation side on Thailand, um, Thailand passed the second Computer Crime Act in 2017, and there are in total there are three Thai laws concerning fake news, which are the Official Government Information Act of 1997, Computer Crime Act of 2007, and Computer Crime Act of 2017. This law have proven useful in combating fake news, but in reality, in Thailand is that these laws are often used as a political tool to silence dissidents and to press criminals and tort charges, for example. The Article 14 
whoever commit these crimes is liable to imprisonment no more than five years, a fine no more than 100,000 baht or a combination of both. Clause one, by deceptions or malintent entered into a computer system article misleading or falsify whether wholly or partially or computer information that is fake with reasonable cause for damage to the people without being slanderous or liable according to criminal laws. Clause two entered into a computer system articles which is false with reasonable cause for damage to na national security, public safety, economic stabilities, or basic infrastructure serving public utility to the nations or cause widespread panic among the people. Clause three entered into a computer system article which violates the security of the nations or anti terrorism provisions of the criminal law. And clause number four entered into a computer system articles which is degrading and lewd and make them available for access to the general public. Clause number five is proliferate computer articles knowing they are in violations of clause number one, two, three, and four. Uh, should commitment of clause number one not be against the people, but rather a particular individuals, the violators is liable to imprisonment no more than three years, a fine no more than 60,000 baht, or a combination of both and settling of these cases permitted. And in, in many cases, aforementioned did actions violate the spirit of the laws and adherence poses an undue burden on the general public. These concern in white public criticisms, especially because of the constitutions make the claim that Article 27, oh, sorry, Article 26, any law which restrict the right or freedom shall be in accordance with the constitutions. In case where no conditions is articulated, this law must not violate the rules of law, not impose undue burden or restrict more than is necessary, and must not be must not rob an individuals of their human dignity. In addition, the rationals of these restrictions must be clearly expressed. Law according to verse one must be generally applicable and not particular to any situations or person. Equally important is that anti fake new regulations is usually left to the judgment of the enforcers or to those with the power to decide what information is indecent, inappropriate, liable to be censored or controlled. And the perpetrators can be criminally prosecuted. This judgment vary from person to person, from day to day. This is a great threat to freedoms of expression of the Thai people. As currently in 2017 constitutions of Thailand, section three, right and liberties of the Thai people. In article 34, the Thai, uh, sorry, the people shall have freedoms of thought of speech, of writings, of prints, of advertisement, and other mediums of expressions. The restrictions of these freedoms is prohibited, except by a special decree to protect national security, to protect other rights or liberties, to maintain peace or public moralities, or to protect public health. The report provides some succinct examples of enforcement in Thailand, but I also would like to remind everyone that when someone commit a crime, they must be treated equally by the law. They cannot claim a special humanitarian exception since they have violated the rights of the others by proliferating falsehoods. Do not forget that the heart of democracy is lined in mutual respects of rights. One rights cannot be allowed to trump others. Beyond that, the Ministry of Digital Economies and and societies has incorporated technologies into the reporting and vetting of fake news. Their official line account is a popular channel for the public to participate in the reporting of vetting of fake news, as well as receive pertinent alerts. It has been greatly successful due to the ease of access, especially since 47 million of Thai users line. But further work is still needed to in the truth seeking process. Since the number of fake news is constantly increasing every day, and in terms of suggestion to help control fake news, 
limit the restrictions on freedom of expressions and reduce government intrusions on the people. I consider that this report is complete and exhausted. So, and thank you. Those are my, my review for the report. Thank you again for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Sirupa, uh, for your thoughtful comments. And so we uh, kindly encourage our participants to please send, re send, re your, send through your questions. Uh, our second poll is coming, so please have a look at that. And there are a few questions that have come in already, and perhaps I will give priority to those. Uh, let me start off by saying that this report uh, of uh, CALD and Asia Center comes is indeed very timely. And I would note the recent remarks of the UN Secretary General uh, on human rights in, in pandemic times. He noted, I use his words, uh, there is a pandemic of rights abuses, including on freedom of speech. And so we could uh, come back to some statistics that he pointed out later on. So we have a couple of, of, um, of um, questions that came in. Let me turn uh, to the first one from a citizen of the Philippines. And I think Francis may still be here. Um, yeah, uh, if Francis is still, is still is here, or this could be for anyone from the Philippines. Uh, it's about, um, I have seen the prevalence of fake news and disinformation leading to many divisive and misleading opinions among Filipinos. Um, with this in mind, does Congress have any plan to take action to create laws that would be a policies and laws to be able to ensure the protection of a free media and mitigate the effects of fake news? Uh, if Francis is here, that would be great. Otherwise, maybe John, uh, you, would you kindly maybe tackle that question? Uh, John, uh, I'm not sure if you heard me. I, I heard you. Uh, is uh, Congressman Francis uh, still online? John, why don't you take it away? If, if, if he's there, he will join. All right. Uh, thank you to Javin for the question. Uh, I don't know uh, if I will have the same uh, point of view uh, as uh, Congressman Abaya, but uh, I don't think we need any new legislation. Uh, regarding uh, regulation of fake news uh, and other forms of disinformation. I think the real problem there is that it gives the government the opportunity to define uh, fake news, and that can be very, very tricky. Uh, hmm. One of the main reasons why our group, uh, which uh, consists of journalists, academics, and civil society uh, representatives, uh, rushed to organize a conference of democracy and disinformation in February 2018 was because we heard that the Philippine press secretary was planning to host a national information summit. And we felt that uh, it was going to be an attempt to define fake news in a way that was partial to the government. So it was a race for time. Um, there are other things that we can do. Uh, we need to engage with uh, tech companies. That's one of the main recommendations of uh, the Asia Center report. We need to do that. We need to to to, uh, to, to let them know uh, exactly you know how we reach decisions uh, when it comes to uh, our stories. Uh, we they, they also need to feel the pressure, so to speak, from uh, Interim groups in society. Um, we need to put pressure. Maybe I'll just give one more example of something else that we can do outside of legislation. Um, it has been proven through uh, research uh, studies that some uh, advertising and public relations executives in the Philippines actually serve as the creative masterminds of disinformation campaigns. So we need to work with the self-regulatory agencies in those professions to find a way to discipline their uh, the members of their industry. So I think those 
two possibilities. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, sorry, uh, John. Uh, and if uh, Congressman Abaya is there, please feel free to jump in. Um, I, I may uh, turn to James for a quick reaction about the, 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 what John says. There is no more need for new, new legislation. Uh, a quick reaction. Yeah, uh, I mean, I agree uh, with uh, John. I, I think non-legal measures uh, that uh, John has just outlined uh, are an additional way to go. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are talking about legisla uh, legislators uh, and parliamentarians. Uh, you, you know, their, their job is uh, to make laws. And, and one of the behaviors they have is they, they like to formulate laws. So if, if they cannot help themselves in formulating <laughs> laws, um, how can we help them, uh, you know, uh, navigate that realm, you know? And, and that's why, you know, pointing to international uh, obligations, best practices and standards that doesn't, you know, um, take away the rights of the rights holder uh, are, are important. Yes, uh, thank you, James. And I would like to link up what James is saying to uh, something that was said earlier, which is about government. John, I think you said it. Government is a primary source of disinformation. And then it calls in, begs uh, the question, well, then what is the role of parliamentarians in this situation? Uh, how do they counter that? A and, uh, you know, uh, being one branch of government I itself, yeah? So let me turn to a second question. Um, um, that came through, uh, since hate speech is one of the most common forms of disinformation that is prevalent in social media, what measures can we be implemented to ensure the protection of victims of the aforementioned and how will it be ensured that hate speech will no longer have a space in the media? Uh, uh, James, I don't know, maybe uh, you could kickstart that one. Yeah, so I'll uh, link it up to what uh, John was saying earlier. Yeah, I'll, I'll kickstart it and, and really, you know, would like to draw John and other colleagues in. Um, uh, I'll kickstart by just saying uh, what's happening in the region uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how they are responding to hate speech. Now, there is an emerging suite of laws. Uh, about four to five uh, countries in the region have begun to articulate. They call it Harmony Bills and commissions. So a range of uh, countries are rolling this out. Um, you know, Singapore has done it quite early. Malaysia has introduced a form of a commission, but it's a bit of stillborn uh, because of the change in government. Um, Myanmar has rolled out and had some discussions, but it's kind of, you know, tucked away. Uh, uh, one of the concerns there is really about uh, problems related to fake news laws as well. You know, they are vaguely worded and they can be used, um, uh, uh, you know, by governments against um, um, citizens. The second issue is uh, within these laws, uh, hate speech is still very narrowly defined uh, along race and religion. Uh, really, uh, it has to be expanded to, to include <clears throat> political identities, <clears throat> gender identities, as well as an emerging xenophobic discourse um, that has been spiked uh, because of the pandemic, the, the very anti-foreign feeling towards refugees, uh, migrant workers, both documented and doc uh, undocumented. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, um, I'll, I'll maybe pass the time to join in, in, in terms of uh, the media's role here as well. Um. Sure, I can join, but I, I would really like to hear what uh, Saripa and uh, Paifen maybe would like to say first. Or, um... Well, uh, uh, John, on that note, could I? Inv I was going to precisely invite uh, Saripa to say something on this, uh, and Asko, of course, uh, Paifen. Uh, here in Thailand, you we in our hate speech conference uh, earlier uh, last year. The issue, since you are the um, chairperson of Called Youth, I thought I would ask you. Uh, here in Thailand, you have had uh, uh, complaints or analysis showing uh, the youth generated, I'm going to use the term a, a bit loosely here, uh, disinformation about certain groups uh, amidst the protests, the elderly people and other groups. Is that something uh, that, that you have noticed um, that you could comment well, on? Well, I think there has been a lot of hate speech from both sides. Uh, 
I think it, it has gone even more aggressive here in Thailand, especially with all the, the use of the social media. Uh, in the report, it, it's, it mentions about claiming that there are a lot of fake news coming from the government side, but at the same time, I experienced a lot of of fake news and hate speech from from the oppositions as well, and and I think again both are just creating a more divisive society, and even they themselves know deeply that that the the news they are spreading are fake. They are willing to do it individually, you know? uh, and as I mentioned earlier that. I also realized that even the parliamentarian themselves are actually not saying the truth in the parliament themselves, and that because in the parliament themselves, even when they, when they when they make speeches in in the parliament, people quote that and thought that the claim that they made are real, but if you actually fact checking it, it's not true. I think it, it's it's turning into. Um, it's it's turning into the, the the state politics now, where Trump can say whatever he wants without. I mean, you would need a fact checking. I think that's how extreme Thailand is going. Thank you. And may I call uh, a Peifen? Would you have any thoughts on this? Yes. Um, so, in my observation, there is hate speech is not that prevalent in Taiwan. I'm not sure if I'm right, but in my observation, I think it's not one of the biggest issues in Taiwan. And but we do not have like laws specifically targeted at the hate speech. We use if it is under the criminal laws. If it's constitutes elements under the criminal laws, then we use criminal laws, but we do not have legislation specifically for hate speech. But there's um, indeed a tendency in the online chat rooms because when you are online, everyone is like either anonymous or feel that they can say whatever they like without taking responsibilities. And that's a, a, a issue that we have to look into. So in sometimes when you the, the, the speech, the hate speech we would not have altered when we are in a face to face interaction, you may um, write down as on the online world. That's something we have to look for. And so um, the characteristics of being anonymous or being not face to face in the online world just make uh, some of the messages and discussions more polarized. That's my observation so far. Thank you very much, Peifen. And maybe let's come back to uh, John uh, for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, maybe just a short reflection on what's happening in the Philippines as far as hate speech is concerned. Uh, I was actually struck uh, when I read when I re read the report uh, the other week. Uh, it made me reconsider some of the practices uh, that we've gotten used to in the Philippines. Um, I'm not sure, but I don't think hate speech as a category has been used as a uh, unit of analysis when we talk about, uh, for instance, uh, the rhetoric of the president. Um, but reading the report, I reflected on the practices of the Duterte government, and I realized that, in fact, uh, that's the way they approached uh, the drug addicts. I mean, there's this language that really dehumanizes them, demeans uh, their very existence. Uh, but, I was, but I was moved to this reflection because I've noticed that the presidential spokesperson uses his almost daily press briefings to directly attack what he calls enemies of the government. And he's talking about all sorts of critics, but the language he uses is very dehumanizing. Uh, before I read the, the report, I, you know, I, I, I would process this as, okay, this is more disinformation and so on. 
yes, it is disinformation, but I think it's also useful to use the framework of hate speech. I think that they are really demonizing uh, the opposition. Uh, I guess that would be one of the that's one of the four uh, Ziblat Levitsky factors, right, for uh, emerging authoritarianism. Uh, the, 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 the legitimization of the political opposition. Uh, and I think that kind of language that they use, the kind of hate speech, uh, uh, makes me think that's, that's the real objective. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, we, we have, a, let me just turn to another question uh, that came through. Uh, which, and this is addressed to Asia Center. What do you think is the outlook for civil society and freedom of expression in Southeast Asia? Uh, looking at current trends of fake news laws, uh, what should what we should what should we pre expect or prepare for in the next five years? Or uh, so? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, you know where we find um, this report, you know, uh, as we work with, call, uh, called, uh, you know, drafting the report, uh, the needle was already moving, the legal needle was already moving. And we saw the first signs uh, without the law uh, uh, being implemented in Myanmar, the shutdowns and the slowdowns. Vietnam has already done, uh, you know, sort of internet and uh, uh, social media platform throttling. And then Cambodia just uh, just recently, you know, introduced a new gateway law. So what they're trying to do, and, and I think that's how the landscape would be uh, in the next few years, is they want to turn off the tap, the internet tap at the source. So you know, because using the law, I mean, it, it is a process. You know, you, you 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 can't you know do mass shutdowns. So I see in the region and elsewhere that the yeah, experimentation of throttling and having internet shutdown in selected cities may be very, very much widened and practice uh, more often. The second uh, thing would be uh, what COVID-19 uh, leaves behind. Uh, what is its negative impact? So crisis has always lead, especially in this part of the region, authoritarian residues. And, and, and whether it's, uh, you know, SARS or whether it was the ripple effect of September 11, um, this time the residue it will leave in the region would be the surveillance residue because the state can track, trace, collect data, doesn't protect your data, they share it within the inter-ministry. Uh, so I think Coming out of this pandemic, I think we will see one of the most surveilled histories of our time. And the younger generation who are the internet, social media generation will become the most surveilled generation. So I think civil society would be dealing with these two uh, developments. Uh, one, you know, uh, the quick shutdown of uh, access to the internet using this new gateway type approaches. And two, uh, they'll be extremely surveilled. So, which means in terms of strategies, you know, um, uh, one may need to go to old tech, perhaps phone, face-to-face -face meeting, all the things that, you know, uh, that, uh, and techniques that we were using pre-internet. And so that's how I see the, the landscape uh, shaping the next few years. Very good, uh, thank you, James. Um, there is an interesting question that just came through from Hunter at ANU, and it concerns collaboration between authoritarian states. So there are rumors, Hunter says, that uh, a certain big country up north, um, begins with a C, uh, China is providing technical, <laughs> technical um, advisors to help Myanmar with its new cybersecurity law to target online dissidents. Uh, might you have any comments, um, the, the speakers present here, any comments on the nature of authoritarians' cooperation with each other to crack down on free speech? And let me just throw in, uh, in relation to that, that on 11 March uh, next month, we, there will be a, a seminar, webinar, Law and Lawlessness, the Myanmar Coup and Human Rights, 9.30 a.m. Bangkok time, 
uh, by, uh, by Asia Center. So, uh, would anyone like to tackle that particular question? Um, any thoughts on collaboration between authoritarians? There, there, let, let, as you were thinking, uh, let me just say, there was a news story about uh, planes from that big country going to Myanmar uh, nightly and um, bringing in stuff um, along these lines, uh, you know, that we are just talking. So maybe Pei Fen, uh, might you have some thoughts on this, this question? Uh, Sorry, we, we, we can't hear you yet. Sorry, Pevin, we, we, we can't hear you yet. Your microphone is muted. Oh, there you go. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, it took a few while to unmute myself. Um, cooperation with the with, uh, within authoritarian regimes, I, on the issue of fake news and disinformation, I, I, I probably, uh, if, if we, I may, I think uh, it's probably not like in, in my, experiences and like in my observations is i see more like uh cooperation with uh like between china as an authoritarian regime and certain groups within like taiwan so uh there are certain groups including political parties including uh civic organizations and even media groups which is uh, very um influential and can be very dangerous in Taiwan. Uh, they they receive like for example news content from Beijing and then they use it, they probably spread this on social media and our traditional media like TV channels use the sources from social media, which is originally from probably from CCP from Beijing or from other uh not legit sources to come to Taiwan and then to copy and then to find uh to eventually to be broadcast on our TV channels or on our newspapers that have a lot of coverage and a lot of influence in Taiwan. And that is a way of cooperation I have seen. And this is also why uh, in my remarks earlier, I shared that Taiwan it's one of the, uh, the it's the country that is most influenced and and penetrated by disinformation from foreign sources. Um, so we have actually uh, one of the ways uh, to deal with this is to resort to legislation <laughs> again. So we had the, uh, the anti-penetration law passed. Uh, more than one year ago, but it's not enough. I think act, uh, there is a certain things that the law can reach and can do or undo. But most importantly is if we want to counter this trend, what we can do is really to teach our citizen, to educate our citizen, to increase at the awareness of this, this thing, the spread of this information and to launch a media literacy campaign to really uh, tell our citizens how to distinguish information that is legit or and from information that is not legit and that is false or that is even um, uh, has other attentions. I think media literacy is Probably not. It probably cannot. We cannot see a quick like impact uh, on that. I mean, 
Uh, but I think that's a, a way to deal with this authoritarian cooperation or authoritarian penetration or influence uh, manipulation in democracies. Because as democratic countries, it's sometimes a little bit hard for us to just ban information or just uh, to, 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 to name uh, certain groups or just to but but um, that is why authoritarian regimes are using our democracies to uh, fight against our democracy. But I still believe that our citizens would be at the core of this response to this kind of authoritarian cooperation and authoritarian penetration. Thank you, Peifen. Um, so um, what you are saying, and I, maybe others might agree, is that um, some authoritarian regimes are not restricting their activities to only other authoritarians. Uh, they, they are targeting a wider range of, uh, of types of countries, including yeah. Taiwan. So um, along those lines, we only have maybe a, a, a less than 10 minutes or so. Uh, Peifen, you said something earlier uh, about Taiwan as a model. Uh, in reaction to the report, and, and I wanted to get uh, James's uh, quick reaction to her uh, suggestion of Taiwan as a model. Yes, uh, I think uh, because of uh, Taiwan's um, unique position uh, uh, and situation, you know, fairly close uh, to Southeast Asia and its policy of uh, uh, engagement with Southeast Asia, I think there can be joint learning between uh, uh, Taiwan and uh, Southeast Asia on the people-to-people -people front, uh, especially in terms of uh, civil society, media, and, and, and also, uh, you know, uh, parliamentarian uh, engagement. So uh, I think uh, Taiwan, you know, emphasis, uh, like many, many states, has been very statist. Uh, its relationship with the region has been, you know, uh, largely around economics uh, and, and also trying to uh, have some form of state-to-state -state, uh, relation or government-level contact because of its special position um, in, in the international system. Uh, but I think tai Taiwan, you know, uh, uh, can begin the conversation, a positive conversation, both uh, 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 with the Taiwanese people and Southeast Asian nations, uh, if it strengthens and, and engages more on the people-to-people -people front. Thank you, James. And we perhaps don't have time to answer this question properly, but the last question came through, um, which you may at least reflect about. It's on the role of legislators uh, with regard to fake news. Uh, since you legislators are there to legislate, how about uh, coming up with legislation that provides support for fact-checking, media literacy, quality journalism. Uh, a quick reaction, uh, John. Um, thank you. Um, I think on that basis, um, I can recommend uh, something like uh, the Soto Law in the Philippines. Uh, which was a law that was passed uh, immediately after World War II. The Soto Law uh reinforces the right of the journalist to refuse to disclose his or her sources in other words the kind of legislation that perhaps we can welcome uh would be legislation like that uh maybe we can call it the give the journalist the benefit of the doubt law uh instead of defining fake news instead of imposing sanctions it's it really just to uh, offer yet another layer of protection for the journalist or actually any citizen who uh, uh, shares information uh, that that sharing is uh, guaranteed. Uh, there are uh, constitutional guarantees and now there are statutory uh, guarantees as well. Maybe along those lines, I think would be uh, legislation would be welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. So uh, we literally have just a couple of minutes and uh, I hope uh, Siripa is uh, still with us. Maybe she could join. Um, and maybe Francis. Um, uh, I wanted to ask Siripa a final qu uh, question, or at least throw her this question. Oh, hello, Siripa. <laughs> so I don't expect you to answer, but I just thought it interesting that, uh, was it yesterday 
Um, there was some very eventful news uh, in Thailand, which has concerns the Minister of Digital Economy. Um, and the reported conviction for seven years imprisonment. Uh, would you have any thoughts uh, on that? Well, I think that it wasn't just him. It was a group of the, the demonstrator back seven years or eight years ago. I'm not sure which year it was. Right. And yes, and the sentence were, were given and they were not allowed bailed on it on eight of them of them right and i think among the eight three were ministers not just the not just minister of digital and and social mm -hmm. affairs also the minister of education and and also of transports as well i see that are that were sentenced to jail and again i think this is to do with the because they they closed down the public venues during the the demonstrations of the Kopopaso mm. back seven or eight years ago, and I think it has shown the example to to the youth that are demonstrating today, because there have been questions why are their friends being arrested, and from this that the, there were a bunch of people who were sentenced yesterday, but several were bailed. And this has shown that they, wait, uh, it's shown that they, they do not, I mean, they, they use the law on, on every, I mean, the legislation that they, they use on everyone is, is the same. There are not being, there are no exceptions. Sure. No, thank you. Thank you. I, I just thought I would solicit, solicit a quick reaction from you. Thank you for that. Uh, before I turn the floor over to our uh, last but not, not least the uh, speaker, if I may put it that way, Moritz, uh, please, I would just like to, to remind you um, that we will be taking a, a group shot of the speakers. Uh, uh, please, so please don't uh, tune out um, uh, too fast. <laughs> okay, and I will end my portion and turn it over to Moritz for some final remarks with uh, the, the timeliness of this report and again linking it up to some of the statistics that have been, come out uh, recently uh, from the UN. In relation to the pandemic of rights abuses, it has been noted that freedom of speech has been under threat in 83 countries. In 51 countries, there have been arrests. In 33 countries, there have been threats to critics and, and defenders. And in 24 countries around the world, uh, and I bring it back to two in particular, which the report cites, East Asia, Southeast Asia, China, and Kong and uh, Cambodia. So, Morris, uh, with that, uh, I would like to invite you, uh, please, to say the, the final remarks. Uh, let me uh, introduce Moritz, please. Uh, Moritz Kleiner Brockhoff, who is a veteran journalist with, who was with Deutsche Welle, and he moved to Indonesia as Southeast Asia correspondent for a German newspaper, uh, let, I hope I say it right, uh, right a, a range of newspapers. <laughs> the Frankfurter Rundschau, Tagesspiegel und Stuttgarter Zeitung. So good, yeah? <laughs> he joined uh, FNF in 2009 and he has wide experience across the region, uh, directing projects on Myanmar, Malaysia, Cambodia. Uh, he has been in uh, Thailand since uh, in Bangkok since December 2018, moving from uh, Indonesia, where you covered Indonesia, Malaysia, right? So, Morris, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Robin. Let me start by saying how uh, how sad I am that we are here discussing this issue today. Yes. If if you had told me five years ago or ten years ago that uh, this information, which is basically systematic lying to achieve <laughs> an end has become a global topic, I would have been shocked. I mean, the threshold for lying has just sunken so much, it's gone mainstream. 
Now I realized that propaganda was always part of um, regimes weapons. I mean, we know this from Germany, from Hitler. We know this uh, from hundreds of years ago, yeah. but it was sort of confined to the bad guys, to those who had to lie because the ugly truth was that they were illegitimate. And with increasing communication channels and with increasing um, yeah, information all over the world, uh, it's just gone viral. It's just gone mainstream. And uh, it, it, it has um, uh, gotten us to a vicious cycle, which uh, James described. Government feel compelled or take advantage of the situation and pass uh, laws that then in turn uh, limit uh, freedom of expression. So uh, it is a very um, serious situation we are in. And that's why this publication, this report um, is so important. And um, I'm, I'm proud that the foundation at FNF was associated with it. And I'd like to close this event by thanking everybody. First of all, everybody involved in the report, our friends at CALT, but here at the Asia Center as well. I know how much work it was, and I know how much expertise it takes to put it into context. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody who participated in uh, today's launching events, our panelists, those who reacted, everybody who spoke, and everybody at the DECAD Secretariat in Manila who helped set this up together with the Asia Center. Everybody, thanks a lot for um, the report and the event today. Thank you. Thank you, Moritz. And uh, let's now please just have a quick um, screenshot, please, James, yes. with the speakers. You should be in the middle. Well, you're flanking me. <laughs> Okay, so uh, here's the countdown to New Year. <laughs> Three, two, one. One more? One more. <laughs> okay, this is countdown to Chinese New Year. Three, two, one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and see you all soon.